Good evening and welcome. My name is Mary Ann Krems and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters in the Stevens Point area. Welcome to this evening's informational session on the five referendum questions that will be on the November 6th ballot. Just so you know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization encouraging informed and active participation in government at the local, state, and national level. We do not endorse candidates or political parties. Local leagues may undertake lengthy study processes in order to adopt local positions on issues important to their communities. Once adopted by its members, a local position may provide the basis for their local league to publicly support a referendum question. For example, our league adopted a position on our community's public school years ago and we have based our public support for the two school district referendum questions on the November ballot on that position. We are not taking a position on any of the other referendum questions. If you are interested in finding out more about the League or joining us, we have membership uh, brochures, which are over here at the table, and business cards or you can talk to any of the members that you see wearing one of these pins. We would like to take this opportunity to say we welcome men as well as women to become members. We are grateful to the staff from our Community Access TV Channel 984 who are taping our program tonight. No personal taping of this session is allowed. At this time, I'd like to ask you to make sure that all your cell phones are turned off. There is a copy of Air Times available at the membership table, and we will post on our website and Facebook as well. And there are a white sheet like this and tell you the times that you can go on 984 and see them. We hope you will find tonight's session informative. I would now like to introduce tonight's moderator, Lynn Markham, who will explain how tonight's program is organized and will introduce our presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. My name is Lynn Markham, and I will be your moderator this evening. I'm a member of the Stevens Point Area League of Women Voters. First, I would like to welcome our presenters. Mr. Craig Gerlach will speak about the Stevens Point School District referenda. Joshua Rosencrans will speak about accessing medical marijuana. Corey Laddick will speak about the dark stores tax loophole. And Chris Holman will speak about the Portage County Health Care Center. Thank you all for being here tonight. Our format this evening will be as follows. There will be four presentations, each limited to five minutes. Sharon in the back will hold up a red card when it is time for the presenter to wrap up his comments. Each presentation will be followed by a maximum 15 minutes of audience questions. If there are not enough questions to fill the 15 minutes, we will move on to the next presentation. If we have time after the final presentation and its questions, additional audience questions addressing any of the referenda may be asked. Questions should be submitted on index cards. If you have a question, please ask an usher, we have ushers on both sides here, for an index card and pencil. Ushers will collect your questions and league members will review and screen the questions for relevance and to avoid duplication. Because of the limited time we have for each referendum this evening, we've asked the presenters to be as brief as possible when answering questions so the audience can learn as much as possible this evening. Following our program, all of the presenters have agreed to move to the lobby to talk with audience members while we put away the chairs in this room. 
Our first presentation is on the two school district referenda questions. Our presenter is Craig Gerlach, superintendent of the Stevens Point Area Public School District. Dr. Gerlach? Thank you. First, I'd uh, like to recognize uh, our board. President uh, Meg Earler in the back and Vice President uh, Chris Scott. I don't believe uh, any other board members are. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, and, and to uh, all of you, thanks uh, for giving up some of your time to give me the opportunity to talk about um, our upcoming referendum. My job um, as superintendent of school is to get this word out in terms of uh, why um, we're going to referendum and uh, what it's all about. So I'm going to attempt to do that in 22 minutes uh, when I have a, a presentation that is longer than 22 minutes. So I'm going to go through this quickly because I think most important uh, when it comes to these type of uh, activities uh, is to uh, hear your questions. You can see in front of you the uh, mission of our school district is to prepare each student to be successful. To the right uh, of that slide, you'll see um, four bullets. Those bullets represent the pillars of our strategic plan. Uh, the first uh, pillar uh, ties into uh, fostering student uh, engagement and growth. That's student learning. That's the most important thing we do. The second most important thing that we're concentrating on is retaining an attraction of staff. The third bullet reflects uh, being very efficient and responsible as it work, uh, relates to operations and facilities. And the fourth bullet that we are concentrating on as a school district is uh, making connections with our community. To be successful with that, um, we need to have proper funding. You can see that uh, up on top, um, there's a graph that shows uh, November uh, 2016. That's the last time we went to a uh, referendum. The issue in our school district comes down to a revenue freeze that was imposed in the state of Wisconsin in 1993, based on 1992 spending. So low spending school districts in 1992 were frozen at a very low level. High spending school districts in 1992 were frozen in 1993 at a very high level. So we have a great discrepancy in, our, in the state of Wisconsin as it relates to districts that spend low and districts that spend high, and we're stuck with that. Stevens Point is a low spending school district. Our revenue is $9,400 per student. It's the minimum in Wisconsin. Now granted, there are many other school districts in our situation. The only way that we can add additional revenue is to go to the public and ask to uh, um, approve a referendum. And that's what we're uh, uh, attempting to do. This is a, um, um, a timeline um, that starts back in, in 2016. That was the year I was hired. About the same time I was hired, we hired a engineering um, consultant firm referred to as Nexus Solutions. Uh, Jeff Mangdon is the back of the room uh, representing uh, Nexus. We've been working with Nexus to um, to uh, do an audit of all of our, our uh, systems and our buildings and our facilities in the school district. Nexus also took several facility studies over the last decade and moved forward working with myself and other administrators to present a proposal to the school board starting last January. There were several tweaks um, and uh, quite uh, frankly reductions as we moved through the process and ultimately the school board approved unanimously uh, to go to a referendum for two questions on November 6th. Um, to address the issues that, we've, that we uh, have quite frankly known about for well over a decade, but we really were able to hone in in terms of some details related to programming, uh, deferred maintenance, safety and security, and learning spaces. And I know I'm going through this fast. When you leave today, uh, please, I've got copies of this presentation that you can take with you. The first issue is our programming uh, issues. That's our annual budget. Um, Eighty percent or so of our budget reflects salaries and benefits of employees. We're teachers. We educate 7,300 students. We have 1,000 employees. The vast majority of those employees are teachers. That is really our operation. So we talk about maintaining programs. Um, we're really talking about maintaining our staff that teach the programs. We're also looking at the need to um, enhance a preventative maintenance budget as well as a technology budget. Going back, when we failed 
the referendum in 06, or we passed it in 06 for three years for $8.8 .8 million. We failed it then in nine and it failed again at 10. We had a significant deficit. The district had to make some very difficult decisions. They made what I thought was a very good decision is to maintain our programs. However, it was at the expense of maintenance and technology. So we move forward to where we're at today, almost a decade later, I think there's an argument that we're running our district with $8 million less. And it's very, very challenging to maintain our programs. So to address this issue, the first question on the ballot is going to um, give the, ask the public to give the uh, school board authority to exceed the revenue limit. The revenue limit is $9,400 per student. To exceed that for programming technology and maintenance. Two uh, million dollars would be earmarked for programs, one million dollars for technology, and five hundred thousand dollars for um, maintenance. That will be an increase to taxes on a hundred thousand dollar home of seventy seven bucks. It's seventy seven cents per thousand. So the average home in our school district is one hundred and forty thousand dollars. The other issues that we have to address are deferred maintenance. Um, again, back in 09, 10, when we failed those referendums, we had to cut something. So we, we, and I believe in that. We believe in people over things. So we put the things aside. We put technology aside. We put maintenance aside. We have 20 buildings, well over $200 million of value, and uh, we have to address issues, um, significant issues. Unfortunately, they're things people don't see. Their boilers in the basement, their, their furnaces, air conditioners, their roofs, their windows, ceiling, their, there's electrical, there's plumbing. We're pulling out right now pipes underneath SPASH, sewer pipes that have decayed. We have several of those pipes throughout our school district. Um, literally, we're busting concrete, we're removing uh, sewer pipes and replacing it, and that is extremely expensive. The other issue that we need to address is safety and security. Um, specifically, we have three buildings that don't have what I refer to as say, uh, secure entrances. We buzz into every one of our buildings, and when you get buzzed in, you go into a secure office, you sign in before you get into the school. We have three buildings where you get buzzed in, both of our junior highs in Plover, Whiting Elementary. You get buzzed in, and you gotta go through hallways to get to an office. You can easily go up a stairwell before you're in the office and you're in the building. We also have to replace our, our security or our surveillance equipment. Um, not all of our buildings have surveillance equipment, and the buildings that do have it, specifically SPASH, um, it's so outdated that it's difficult to get clear pictures when we pull f um, footage out um, as it relates to trying to figure out maybe what happened in a specific hallway. That alone is three million dollars, just to give you an idea of, of what we're talking about. And then we want to improve uh, our learning spaces. We're going to look at remodeling um, some of our elementary spaces that were built in the 50s, they're very small rooms. We need to uh, make larger spaces. We are going to um, add a cafeteria on SPASH, a commons area, so all of our students can eat in one place. We can better supervise them. Uh, they'll also uh, provide a large place for, for large lectures, for a large uh, community space for all of the community programs that we have to include bathrooms. We don't have any bathrooms in our field house. If you've been to graduation, athletic events, you've got to go to the other side of the building uh, for bathrooms. So we uh, have those needs. And then we go to uh, our final question, which is a bond referendum. Bond referendum is very much like your, your mortgage. You borrow, um, you borrow money, you pay principal and interest over 20, 30 years, and then when that bond is paid off, uh, the debt goes away. The bond referendum um, is to allow the board to borrow, and I know this is a lot of money, $75.9 million to meet the needs of what I just talked about. That would be a 69 cent per thousand increase, or $69 on a $100,000 home. 50 million of that is for deferred maintenance. And to give you an idea of what deferred maintenance cost, PJ Jacobs has the original steam heat system. It's over 80 years old. That alone costs $7 million. 
So that's where we're at. It's time to do this. Quite frankly, the time to do this was probably a decade ago. Uh, costs are going to go up. Interest rates are going to go up. Construction costs go up. These problems aren't going to go away. So we really do need to address that. Um, here's the tax rate. If we pass both these questions, it's a dollar. It's a hundred and forty-six dollar increase on a hundred thousand dollar evaluation. So you can prorate up, prorate down, depending on your own personal uh, situation. And then, if you can take a look at the graph, uh, that reflects the tax rate in the area. The green line is the state. We are the far left at seven dollars and forty-five cents per thousand. Wausau is on the far right at. $11.12. If we pass both questions, we go from here to here. We'll still be, have the lowest tax rate in the area. We'll still be below the state average. So that's where we're at today. The, uh, the vote's uh, on November 6th. Um, please vote. Um, please tell your neighbors and friends to vote. I can't tell you how to vote. I just ask that you vote and that you're uh, informed. So if you have people that want more information, this is almost, at the end of the week, my 80th presentation. So I got another week, I could get 80 more in, I think. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, we're going to take turns here at the microphone so that this is all taped. Um, so I have the initial three questions um, from the audience. The first one is, if this referendum fails, when is the district able to go to referendum again in the future? What are we doing for time? Thank you, perfect. Um, if it fails, uh, we could go back in, uh, well, we could go back in February, we'd have enough days, it'd be extremely challenging to do that. Uh, but keep in mind, if, it, if the first question fails, the operational referendum, where we're asking to exceed the revenue limit, each year the revenue limit's going to go up now. Uh, last year the governor created some, uh, some language in the budget that is trying to, to uh, reduce the gap between high revenue and low revenue. So we're looking at trying to bring the bottom up. We're on the bottom. If we fail this, however, there's a penalty. We're frozen for three years. That'll cost us $4 million over the next three years. Now, we can go back to, to referendum, however, as early as February. That would be challenging. It, quite frankly, I'm more interested at in putting all my energy into getting the information about this out on November 7th. If we pass this, there's a tremendous amount of work to do. If we don't, we need to step back, take a breather, and make some extremely difficult choices. Okay. I think you've partially answered this, but the question is, will a failed referendum impact how much money the district receives from the state? Uh, yes, we'll, we'll have a freeze for, for three years. If we fail the bond ref referendum, that doesn't have anything to do with that. It's just the operational referendum. Okay. And you just talked about Wausau funding, but this question is a bit more general. How does spending per student in Stevens Point compare with that of other neighboring communities? Uh, we're, we're, a lower spend, we're a low spending school district for a couple reasons. Back in 1993, when we, were, when we had revenue limits imposed, we were low spending. Um, the others, however, and I don't want to be misleading, the others have already passed referendums. So their tax increase is already on there. So that, that tells the story right there. We're, we're, a, we're a low spending school district in the state of Wisconsin. We always have been. That's not a bad thing. You know, we don't want to be the highest. If I was up here, if we were Wausau and I was saying we, got, we need more money, that'd be a problem. Um, this district has always been very frugal and always res very responsible. And you can credit past school boards and administration for, for, for putting a, us in a good situation. We have a very strong fund balance. We just don't have the operational dollars to, to keep our programming and meet the needs of our facility Im Im improvements. But again, we are a, a low spending school district uh, in comparison to our neighbors. The next question is, is there any way to deal with the deferred maintenance without making expansions? The deferred maintenance is about $50 million of the 70, 
five point. Uh, so the deferred ma maintenance and, and the expansions, yeah, they're two different things. Uh, 50 million is for deferred maintenance. That stuff has to get done. If we don't, it has to get done. If this doesn't pass, I don't know what that means. It, it may mean less programming. We've got to come up with the money for, for that. Typically what happens when you fail a referendum, you reduce something and you come back. We can't reduce our deferred maintenance. How long can we go at PJ Jacobs with an 80 plus year old steam system? Pay me now, pay me later. Um, the others, it's all in one. We separated the two questions, operations and facilities because we had a study with Nexus Solutions saying if you put it all together like we did in 09 and force people to, to make a decision on everything, operations and facilities, it's not going to pass. You've got to split them. However, maintenance is about $50 million. Security, uh, safety and security is about $3 million. That leaves about $22 million dollars if you want to say expansions, yes, we are looking at some expansions at SPASH. Part of the expansion I missed was an increase to our technology education center. Right now, there's over 400 jobs open in central Wisconsin related to technology, whether it be information technology, coding, uh, engineering, manufacturing. We need to do a better job getting our kids involved in, uh, into uh, programs related to technology um, to meet the needs of our workforce in central Wisconsin. So we need those expansions. So it's all in one. Yes, we are looking at doing some remodeling of some very old facilities that need to have spaces that are more conducive to student learning today. They were built in the 50s and 60s. They're very small classrooms. We need more space for students. Students need to move around more today um, as it relates to the educational process. Okay, and our last question, how many years is the bond referendum spread over and how many years will taxpayers be responsible for the building improvement referendum? 20 years. We are allowed by state uh, statute to bond out for 20 years. Now that could be um, a, a, a draw this spring. It's this, this work's going to take th at least three years. So we may not make a la another, a, all of it. We might draw some this year, next year, depending on how the projects lay out. It'll be 20 years after the last draw. So if we draw the last draw in three years, it'd be 23 years from now. Alrighty. So we'll move on to That's it. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Our next presenter, Joshua Rosencrans, will speak about the medical marijuana referendum question. All right. Let's let's get cracking. So, <clears throat> This is the question that is going to be on the ballot for the November election. Um, should the state of Wisconsin allow individuals with debilitating medical conditions to use and safely access marijuana for medical purposes if those individuals have a written treatment or slash recommendation from a licensed Wisconsin physician? A yes vote would indicate you believe that those individuals with debilitating medical conditions uh, should be allowed to safely use and access marijuana for said purposes um, following the written approval of a physician. A no vote is pretty self-explanatory. It is the polar opposite of a yes vote. You do not believe that the state of Wisconsin should allow these individuals um, to access marijuana for these purposes. This question is a non-binding referendum. It is an advisory referendum. This means that what we are doing as a community, as a county, is that we are sending a message to Madison informing them of where we as a community stand on this particular issue. Um, we're basically informing our state government if you know, we do stand with medical cannabis or if we do not. Now before we take questions, I wanted to um, ask, I wanted to already just talk about a couple slides. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is potency. So we're going to do some math. So I hope you like math, because I hate it. <laughs> But this is easy, so I like this. So um, in the field of pharmacology, we study what is called, or we have what is called the dose-response curve. This is an equation which is used to determine whether or not a drug is 
it's safe or if it is unsafe. Um, we use this in pharmacology because cannabis is a drug, much like the other ones that I've listed. Um, regardless of, I get these questions all the time. I hear a lot that, um, you know, well, cannabis isn't what it was like in the 70s. Well, of course it's not what it was like when Xixi Chong were blazing up. Um, <laughs> it's a little different. Um, it's more potent these days. However, despite its increase in potency, it is still a non-toxic substance, and we can substantiate it with this data here. Now, you see LB50 and the ED50 equals TI. The LB50 stands for the lethal dose for 50% of the population. The ED50 stands for the effective dose for 50% of the population. The LD basically means that that is the minimal amount of any drug you need to take in order to die. Whereas the ED50 is the minimal amount of any drug you need in order to elicit an effect. So it's written on your bottle of ibuprofen, take two or three tablets of water. The TI, therapeutic index, is a numerical ranking of how safe or how unsafe that drug is. The larger the number, the safer the drug. So if we look at sevobarbital, which is a very common barbiturate drug, it's a sleeping drug, uh, ED50 is 100 to 300 milligrams, but our LD50 is 1,000 to 5,000. This gives it a therapeutic index of 3 to 50, which is a little dangerous. If you're uh, spacey like me, and you uh, take three, three of the tablets, and then you kind of forget what you're doing, and you go back to doing whatever you want, and you come back and, oh, I forgot to take the drug, and you take three more, look how close you're getting. You're at 600 milligrams. You're already approaching on that limit. So, Pretty major struck. Alcohol. We're all familiar with alcohol because we all live in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, ED50 is about 0.05 to 0.1% blood alcohol concentration. At that point, my German grandmother would say you're plus. <laughs> <laughs> 0.4 to 0.5%, you're probably going to fall asleep and you won't wake up. Now, delta 9 THC is the active side by active uh, derivative chemical which is located in cannabis. Um, now, because I, I have to say this, there has never in all of human civilization on this planet been a recorded overdose of marijuana. No one has ever smoked themselves to death. It's never happened. So when we are gauging the toxicity of the substance, we can't use human subjects because A, we have no data to rely on, and B, we don't we can't obviously you know pump someone full of THC until they die. It's unethical. So the researchers, uh, they took a rat, they pumped it full of THC until it died, and they extrapolated the data to a normal human subject. For an ED50, you need about 50 milligrams of delta-9 per kilogram of body fat. Your lethal dose, you need about 2,160,000 micrograms of THC per kilogram of body fat. This engenders a therapeutic index of about 40,000. To put that in perspective, if I wanted to commit suicide via THC, for whatever reason, I would have to smoke the equivalent of about 450 joints in, in, within a 15 minute time span. The only problem is that that number does not account for smoke or THC, which is lost in the side stream. The cigarette is still lit. So the number we're looking at is more in the ballpark of about 900. 900 joints within a five, 15 minute time frame. So overdosing on this drug is rather impossible, despite the recent increases in potency. Um, we only have a couple more minutes here. Uh, this is the other thing I wanted to talk about, because I also receive this question a lot, and it's about dependence liability, which is a very valid concern. Um, you know, we're all worried, you know, can this drug get me hooked? Well, um, we kind of have an answer. Um, because in science, you know, it's a dirty, you can't, ever, you can't ever say, I've proved in science, even though theory of gravity is theoretically not been proven every day. But this study was conducted in the United Kingdom. They used a Delphi analysis. What that means is basically they got a bunch of experts in the room and they talked about the drugs and they answered a bunch of questions. Um, and then they rated all these drugs using a three-point system. Now I know it's rather hard to read, but green line indicates social harm, red harm, red line indicates possibility of uh, dependence, the blue line indicates physical harm. Now it's hard to see. Also, does this thing have a laser pointer? Yes. Perfect. Now if we see here, cannabis is right here. We see that in a three-point system, in terms of dependence and social harm, cannabis is about here. Nicotine, which is legal, is about here. As you can see, this is significant, tobacco is significantly more addictive than cannabis. The same thing can be said for alcohol. Red line right here, red line for cannabis right there. You see that alcohol causes is significantly more dependence liability than cannabis. And on top of that, alcohol, as you can also see, 
seems to engender more social harms than cannabis does. And obviously heroin, as we all know, that one is in the lead. So um, that being said, those are really the only two slides that I really wanted to go over with right at the get-go. I am ready to take questions whenever, uh, whenever you folks are ready. Okay, our first question. How will doctors be allowed to prescribe cannabis to patients if this is approved? Uh, if this is approved, well first off, I mean, I need, you need to remember that that's this. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, like I said, I'm spacey. Well, we need to remember that um, this referendum is not a binding referendum. Um, so even if this vote does go through, and even if Portage County does vote unanimously, yes, you know, we want legal medical marijuana, it doesn't mean that it will go into effect, because what we are doing is we are informing Madison how we feel on the issue. However, um, I would argue best case scenario, if, this, if Madison listens and, and says, okay, yeah, great, we'll enact medical cannabis in Wisconsin. Um, basically, and I actually have a couple slides on this, um, there is a, there's a lot of, um, the list for ailments that are, uh, can be treated with cannabis is somewhat extensive. Um, basically, if you would be suffering from something like chronic pain, cancer, uh, fibromyalgia, um, glaucoma, Parkinson's disease, uh, even epileptic, epileptic seizures, um, victims of HIV and AIDS. These would be conditions which I would argue would be approved by your doctors. Your doctors would most likely take data and studies which were conducted in medical states such as Colorado, Michigan, or Illinois, and I would assume they would also be reading up on studies as well to, in order to determine what, is, what exactly is the uh, best course of treatment. Um, with some patients, doctors will often prescribe prescription drugs, conventional medications first, oftentimes, I guess, re reserving cannabis as kind of a, uh, you know, dead last type deal. But it really depends. I would argue it depends on who your doctor is and it depends on the type of relationship that you have with your licensed uh, practitioner. Our next question is, how significant is the concern that cannabis is a gateway drug? Mm. I'm glad you asked that. None at all. Reason is this. Uh, no, it's in here. I actually have a slide dedicated just for this. Opiate abuse. Opiates, the difference between opiates and heroin is that one of them is only, watered down, is only a watered down version of the other. Heroin and opiates have one thing in common. They are both derived from the opium uh, flower, which is commonly grown in the Middle East. You cut it open, you get opium. From that chemical, from that compound, we get our opiate drugs. We get, you know, oxycodone, et cetera, et cetera. We also get street heroin and fentanyl. Fentanyl, as you know, is 80 times more potent than heroin. The idea that marijuana is, a, that cannabis is a gateway drug um, has very uh, little scientific data. If we look here, it should be noted that states that have enacted medical cannabis laws had experienced a 23% reduction in hospitalizations related to opiate dependence or abuse. This is a study which was conducted out of the University of uh, California, San Diego. Um, furthermore, this being said, um, a study that was also published in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that, and I quote, the longitudinal analysis of Medicare Part D found that prescriptions filled for all opioids decreased by 2.11 million daily doses per year from an average of 23.08 million daily doses per year when a state instituted any medical cannabis laws. Uh, prescriptions for all opioids decreased by 3.742 million daily doses per year when medical cannabis dispensaries opened. Opiate drugs are very, are rather dangerous substances. You all remember the very first slide that I showed you about potency, toxicity, your LD50s, ED50s. How many of you remember that? Raise your hand. You're in class now. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Good. You're paying attention. The therapeutic index for these opiate drugs is quite low. Um, it's very easy to overdose. Whereas with marijuana, it is very, very difficult to overdose. And as we have seen, as the data suggests, uh, it seems to suggest that um, states which have enacted cannabis, medical cannabis laws are not experiencing an, in, an increase in opiate abuse. If marijuana was a gateway drug, 
which, I, I mean, if it was, we shouldn't be seeing a 23% reduction in opiate abuse. We should be seeing the polar opposite. So the idea that uh, marijuana is a gateway drug has very, very uh, little to no statistical backing at all, uh, at least if you want to go by the data. Um, just hope that that, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Um, our next question is, but medical marijuana would not be smoked. So in what form is it administered, and how does that affect toxicity? Um, it I would argue it depends on which state you're in. Um, there's, I mean, medical marijuana, I can guarantee you it's smoked. Um, Illinois, Michigan, uh, those all have dispensaries in which uh, the crop is grown on site, and it is administered, and you can't smoke it. There are uh, various tinctures, edibles, which uh, can be made from it. Um, there is, the FDA has recently approved, I believe, uh, two medications which are derived from cannabis. One is called Drobinol, and the other is called uh, um, Epidiolex. The only problem with these drugs is that they are idiotically expensive. Um, I, I mean, uh, I, I suppose that they're really that's all I really have for that. In terms of toxicity, I'm really unsure as to what the question is really asking because um, smoking the drug versus um, taking it orally really doesn't seem to have an impact on toxicity. Um, the drug still remains non-toxic, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it takes at least two million, I, I believe the figure is, uh, you need about 2,160,000 micrograms of delta-9 THC per kilogram of body fat in order to kill you. Um, this is a monstrous dose. In terms of toxicity, um, I, I think there are more pressing matters to worry about. We have two more questions on this. Um, this one is, what are the serious medical, medical conditions that cannabis has been shown to help? And I think I saw those on some of your slides. Mm -hmm. Excellent question, excellent question. Um, there is, uh, I mean, I, all my slides have a bunch of stuff on them. Crohn's disease is uh, definitely one. Uh, due to the illegality of this drug, however, the research specifically regarding Crohn's disease is rather scant outside of anecdotal evidence. However, um, a study which was published in the Is Real uh, Medical Association Journal found that 30 patients being examined um, uh, were treated with uh, medical cannabis. 21 of them uh, improved after being uh, treated with that drug. Um, chronic pain is certainly one uh, one uh, debilitating condition which has been uh, treated with medical cannabis mm -hmm. and most sufferers uh, report that they feel uh, definitely more relief, they're more alert as opposed to using opiate drugs. Um, that's what the data so far is telling us. Um, let's see here. An updated version, oh yeah, this is obviously extremely uh, lengthy, but um, as it says here, uh, there are two studies that I can think of which were done. Uh, one by Campbell in 2011, the other by Ware in 2015. This one here supported this one and their findings, which further supported the fact that um, cannabis was found to be safe and effective in treating chronic pain. Uh, there's another one, uh, PDSD is one that comes to mind for me especially. Um, if it's here, is it not here? Well. Suffice to say, okay, I'm sorry, I guess it's not here. Um, but anyway, yeah, PTSD is also another, uh, is another uh, clinical problem which uh, many people who suffer from PTSD have reported significant uh, increases in their uh, quality of living from day to day life when using medical cannabis. Um, uh, there's one study here, uh, it's not on here but I have it here. Um, evidence is somewhat limited but the most compelling study um, comes from uh, George R. Career in 2014. After administering medical cannabis to 80 patients who were admitted in the uh, New Mexico Medical Cannabis Program, uh, they were evaluated for PTSD using the clinician-administered PTSD scale. Patients were then evaluated retrospectively, means they were evaluated after the fact. And once reevaluation was completed, uh, the researchers had found that patients which had used cannabis reported a significant reduction in symptomology of PTSD. Uh, significant reduction, 75% of in reduction in all symptoms was reported overall by the researchers. So, okay. that's, and that's just really a, 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 a scratching the surface. Um, there's a lot of ailments which are, as the research gets updated, there are more ailments which are being dis discovered which can be treated with Delta-9 THC and with CBD. 
And one last question, it's a short one. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're looking for a little bit of background oh, in terms of your background geez. related to this topic. <laughs> All right. All right, well, uh, thanks for raising the tension up here. <laughs> My name, sorry, I didn't really introduce myself earlier. My name is Joshua Rosenkrantz. Uh, I'm a, uh, I live here. I came from Wausau, but I live here. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. I studied psychology with a human services emphasis. And uh, for my senior project, I actually did research on this very drug. I conducted and I uh, basically conducted a research review where I gathered a bunch of data and I compared marijuana specifically to alcohol and tobacco. I presented that research at two undergraduate symposiums. I was working side by side with uh, uh, Dr. David Berry at the university and along with uh, Dr. Mark Plonsky and I couldn't have made it with, without them. But uh, if you've got any more questions about who I am, I'll be in the lobby. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, our third presenter tonight will be Corey Laddick, City of Stevens Point Treasurer. He will speak about the dark stores referendum question. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so and I'll try and make this as understandable as, as it can be made in, in a five minute presentation. Uh, but basically, to, to start it off, uh, to understand the dark store loophole, you kind of have to understand how property is assessed. And there's really three methods for assessing property. The first is the sales comparison or market approach, and that's based on other properties that are similar. What are they selling for? And then using that to establish a value of a property. You also have the cost approach where uh, the assessor looks at the cost of building that building or that facility and then subtracts depreciation and uses that to establish a value. Or there's the income approach where basically you're looking at a property as a financial investment. What kind of rents does it produce? What kind of income does it produce? And then using that to determine a value. So typically all three of these approaches can be used and ideally all three are in valuing properties. Now we have the dark store theory and you say okay what's the dark store theory? Basically this applies primarily to big box stores and what they want to do is rather than using all three approaches to value, uh, they want to use just one. They want to use the sales comparison approach even if there aren't good comparable sales and of course that's a real issue because it's not very often that uh, a Menards or a Walmart is bought and sold uh, between two different parties and so most of those sales are of vacant dark stores stores that are no longer in operation and that's what they want to use to determine their value. So they want to take a store that they might have spent a significant amount of money to build and they want to determine that value simply based on other sales of vacant dark stores. And the basic premise of this argument is that, well, if we leave, if we move out and we're Menards or we're Lowe's or we're Walmart, you know, who else is really going to come in here and buy this? So we're probably not going to be able to sell it for very much. So we don't think that our value is very much. So therefore, we shouldn't have to pay very much in property taxes. So the arguments for the dark store theory are pretty simple, basically that values should be based on what a property could hypothetically be sold for, regardless of whether or not we're looking to sell it, and that certain very specialized properties may not be easy to sell, therefore they have little value. Now the arguments on the, the other side of it, uh, there are a couple of them, but one is if it has little value, why did you spend so much money building it? For instance, there's a, a Lowe's in Wauwatosa. They spent $16 million to build it. 
It's assessed for 13.6 million. Lowe's is arguing that their assessment should be 7.1 million. So it, it really raises the question, well, why did you spend $16 million to build something that, in your opinion, is only worth 7.1 million? Wasn't that a bad investment on your part? Um, the other key objection that I think a lot of people would have to it is that this is why there are other approaches for properties like this that don't have good sales comparables. That's why you have the cost approach and the income approach specifically uh, to, to allow a method to value properties that don't have a lot of sales comparables. Um, also properties are supposed to be assessed based on their highest and best use, not on hypothetical distress. It would be much, if I tried to argue my assessment with the assessor and wanted to point to foreclosed properties or abandoned properties and others that aren't really a good comparable for my property. And then finally, uh, a big concern with the dark store th theory is that we should be taxing value rather than taxing liquidity. And when I say liquidity, I mean how easy is it to sell? Because residential homes are very easy to sell uh, because they're all designed basically for human beings to live in them. They all have bathrooms and kitchens and living rooms and the kind of things that human beings need to, to live. Uh, so it's very easy to sell residential properties, so if that's how we're going to base our tax system is on how easy a property is to sell, uh, one thing that I can tell you as far as the effect is that that's going to be a, a fairly significant shift to residential properties and away from businesses because businesses tend to have more specialized facilities that are going to be more difficult to sell. Um, so as, as far as the effects, we've talked about the theory uh, and, and the philosophy, but the effects are pretty simple. That if we determine value, which is going to determine how much different groups of people pay in, in property taxes, if we determine that based on how easy something is to sell, there's going to be sh a shift in the tax burden to residential properties from businesses. Now the other thing that a lot of people don't understand about local taxation is that taxation limits are based on a total dollar amount, not on the tax rate. So there are some people who think that, and, and this is a common misconception, that we set a tax rate and then we figure out how much value we have and we collect uh, however much money that is. That's actually not true. We do it the opposite. We set a dollar amount as far as what we need to collect for the services, whether it's the city, the county, or the school district, or the tech college, and then that burden is spread over all of uh, the, the taxpayers. So if the values go down, it simply means higher tax rates for the rest of the taxpayers. It doesn't mean less money in government coffers. And to give you an example, sort of so you can visualize this, is so last year in 2018, we had a total tax levy of $16 million. We divided that by our assessed value of almost $1.7 billion. That gets you a tax rate of $9.56 per thousand of assessed value. Now, hypothetically, what would happen if we lost 10% of our assessed value? Well, the answer is our budget wouldn't change because we need a set amount to provide the services that, that people of this community want. It would be over a, a lower value, and then the result, uh, because you're, you're dividing that tax levy by less value, is you'd end up with a tax rate instead of $9.56 of $10.62. Uh, this isn't just a hypothetical. Manawa, a very small community, little ways away from us, uh, they had a major employer who uh, contested their value and contested their assessment. They were the largest taxpayer in that town. 
they got the value reduced. The result was a 14% tax increase on everybody else in that town. And as you can imagine, the people there weren't too happy, especially since you have that 14% increase and you're not even getting anything extra with that. The schools aren't getting any extra money. The, the local community isn't getting extra money. You're just paying more so somebody else uh, can pay less. Um, for the city of Stevens Point, it, it, it could be a significant concern because a lot of people just think about homeowners and residential as far as paying property taxes. Actually, for the city, only 52% of our tax base is residential. The other 48% is commercial, manufacturing, and business. So you can see that if things really change as far as how we need to assess properties, you could see a very significant shift as far as the residential box getting quite a bit bigger. And that doesn't just affect residents of the city of Stevens Point. If you're in the same school district with us, if you're in the same county with us, uh, all of those taxes then will get spread over less tax base and you'll um, also pay more in taxes even if you live in the town of Hull, Plover, or Whiting. Uh, right now, Plover uh, does have several big box stores that are currently suing the village. As a city taxpayer, I might think that doesn't affect me, but actually it does because I'm in the same school district as Plover, I'm in the same county as Plover, and if there's less tax base in Plover, that's going to affect me personally as a taxpayer. So putting on my city treasurer hat, uh, this actually is not quite so concerning. Granted, we might have uh, some people who are upset about the shift in taxes, but it's not going to really affect our budget in, in any significant way. However, as a homeowner, as a property owner in this community, I am concerned about it because I'm concerned about picking up uh, basically somebody else's tab and having to cover more of the cost of providing local services. There are some effects on local governments. One is refunds, uh, which we sometimes have to get back when we get sued, and then also the legal expenses. Hasn't been too bad for the city. I know of another community who this year is looking at spending about $750,000 on legal expenses. And of course that's a, a significant concern and that's almost to the point where we have people who are uh, almost trying to wear us down with uh, with with legal challenges. So, and then finally, just one other uh, thing to, to be aware of is, you know, of course, Halloween is coming up, and uh, obviously you have to be a little bit careful about how you choose your, your costume, and here's why. So, I'll let you look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and with that, I'll take the questions. Sure. <laughs> Okay, our first question is, is this dark store loophole being used now in Wisconsin? Is the purpose of the referendum to change the way the stores are assessed or to prevent the use of the dark store theory or loophole? So right now, the dark store loophole is basically a legal challenge. I wouldn't say that it's really recognized as the right way to assess property, but what you have happening is you have companies who are making this dark store theory argument and bringing that forward in court, and then it's really up for the courts to decide, okay, do we buy this argument of this dark store theory? Do we think that it's appropriate to use comparables of dark stores or not. So right now it's, it's an issue that's being fought out in the courts and uh, certainly if we can close that loophole and get some clarification that no actually you can't use comparables from vacant stores that are currently dark, what that would do is it would provide some clarification so that there isn't so much of this taking place in the, in the courts and racking up legal expenses on both sides. Um, and then it would also protect taxpayers from having those big shifts if the courts rule that, uh, yeah, you're assessing too much and, and this store should only be worth uh, this amount. 
The next question is, I've heard from early voters that the question on the ballot is confusing. Can you let us know how it's worded and what different answers mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I, I would say the question on the ballot is a little bit long as, as far as the description. What you really need to know is that if you vote yes, you are voting to close the dark store loophole. If you vote no, you'd be voting against closing the dark store loophole. Um, two questions that relate back to the pie chart. Um, the first is what is the difference between personal property and residential on the pie chart? Sure, that's a great question. Personal property is a class of property that does not apply to residential. It actually applies to businesses. And it is taxing not the real estate, but the contents of a building. So for instance, if this was uh, a business that we were, we were taxing for personal property, uh, you could tax the, the value of the podium, the chairs, the tables, the other amenities in the building, uh, the bookshelves uh, out in the library, uh, rather than just the property. That's a tax that does not apply to residential. Uh, so for instance, in your house, you don't have to pay for you know, your bed and your couch and your furniture, uh, but businesses do, and that's called the personal property tax. And the other question related to the pie chart, um, clearly you answer what percentage of the city's tax base comes from business and from residents. Um, the follow-up question is, has that changed since the Republicans have been in control of the state legislature since 2010? And then the same question for Portage County and the Village of Plover. Sure. So. Um Okay, the, the main change that we had recently locally uh, was actually related more to a revaluation where every so often uh, the values need to be updated because they're out of date. We didn't have a, a revaluation since 2004. Uh, we did have one last year and that did change the pie chart to some extent. Uh, before the revaluation, residential was at about 50%, uh, and with the revaluation, that did increase to 52%. So there was some change toward residential based on the updating of those values. Uh, part of that, is, my opinion as far as part of that would be that residential properties are are selling very well right now you have a shortage of single-family homes in the community and that's driving prices up do we have time for one more okay um, the last question <laughs> more of a theoretical question maybe why do the courts allow the dark store concept <laughs> Th that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, it's, it's obviously I have an opinion about it. I think a lot of people have an opinion about it. I, I guess I would say I kind of gave you the arguments for and against. Uh, as you can imagine, you have lawyers on both sides. You have expert witnesses making those arguments for and against. And uh, as far as why the courts are determining that, uh, I, I can only assume that they feel moved or compelled by uh, the arguments for the dark store loophole. Okay, our final presenter is County Executive Chris Holman. He will speak about the Portage County Health Care Center referendum question. You bet. Good evening. Who doesn't have one of these?
in lieu of a presentation, I put together just a one pager to try to give everybody the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about when it comes to the healthcare center referendum. Uh, there's, as many of you know, this is an issue we've been talking about in the county since about 2001. So there's been a lot of you know conversations taking place over the years. There's a lot of details you could dive into, and really the the sector, the healthcare sector in general, has changed so much over time that uh, it would it would be easy to dive into all those details, come out, and not really know where we're headed. So what you have here is just the nuts and bolts. I'm going to work through this real quick. Um, essentially, what is a referendum? Uh, we're asking county voters to authorize the county to exceed the levy by one point or up to 1.4 million dollars for four years. Uh, the, if you see this at the bottom, this is a question map that I put together because the the referendum question for the advisory referendums are actually much clearer than what you see and here and what you will see on the ballot. This is dictated by state statute. It's really frustrating. Uh, so it, it was important to me to try to give people like the opportunity to see the question before they actually saw it on the ballot and then to understand what each of the parts actually referred to so that they wouldn't come away from it with a misunderstanding about what exactly is being asked of them. Um, what is it for? Uh, the referendum, if it passes, will support uh, funding the operations of the center. Uh, if you see there, I said it's not for the construction of a new facility. The reason I mentioned that is there was an article that came out last week in the Gazette and on the City Times where there was some confusion over what the referendum was for. That has since been retracted, thankfully, and now there's some clarification. But still, it was a really unfortunate uh, instance, and so I wanted to be very clear uh, tonight th that that is still not the case. It not, has nothing to do with building a new facility. It's only for operating the facility for the next four years. Uh, why is it needed? So I led with the public sector health care centers in Wisconsin. They average a 20% net loss per year. A lot of that isn't their fault because they're kind of caught between the worlds of the healthcare insurance world and then the providers and they have to kind of operate as best they can within that. So for instance, the Medicaid reimbursement that the healthcare center receives for patients who have that as their uh, payer source, it only reimburses about half of the cost of providing that service to those patients. And so every day that you have a Medicaid patient in the facility, there's a, there's a deficit, so to speak, in that room. Uh, that could be changed if the state legislature were to change the reimbursement rate uh, for Medicaid, but so far they have not done that. Uh, there are other issues, of course. The trend uh, in general is people are wanting to age in place, stay at home as long as possible. Uh, insurance companies are putting caps on how long people can stay at the hospital, at the healthcare center, at any sort of healthcare related facility. So you see a lot of changes coming from. Uh, the federal level and the state level that uh, are are complicating the operations for the healthcare center. And you know, each year, for instance, they get more and more regulations. And you know, the latest round, <coughs> excuse me, the latest round of regulations uh, actually kind of extended just getting someone into the facility. The admissions process took you know maybe half an hour to 45 minutes, and, and now takes you know three, four, four and a half hours because everything you have to pull the patients through is much more robust and so that in and of itself takes time away from the from the staff takes time away from everything else and so the center has to figure out how do we now balance this new requirement with everything else we have to do uh, of course the county is similar to the schools uh, and municipalities and others are, are kind of hamstrung by the levy caps that are in place. So we're not allowed to raise our property tax levy. What that means is that each year the county starts the budget cycle without enough money to make, uh, to cover just the basic costs, cost increase for just normal things, nothing new. Uh, just the consumer price index, for instance. So like this year, our net new construction was 1.81%. CPI right now is about 2.9%. So right away you're looking at a 1% deficit before you even get started. Um, the levy support from the county, uh, about eight, nine years ago, it was closer to one and a half million dollars per year in levy support. Since then it's taken a very steep nosedive to where it is now at about $100,000 a year. Uh, some of that is because of the levy cap in terms of you have to shift money around to try to cover mandated programs and costs in other places and those were decisions made by previous uh, county boards and administrations. Uh, some of that is wrapped up in that when, for instance, uh, if 
one of those years, if, if the deficit was only a million dollars, but the levy support was one and a half million dollars, and that excess half a million went to the reserves of the healthcare center. And so then some of that, the reserves have been, have been spent the last couple of years anyway, uh, so it's kind of past levy money that's now you know, being spent to cover costs uh, this year, for instance, and last year. Um, I already said that the healthcare center or healthcare industry is very regulated, but it's important to note that it's a really challenging world for everybody to try to navigate. It's not just healthcare centers, it's hospitals, it's clinics, it's, you know, everyone who's got a foot in the game in this world is having a very difficult time trying to figure out how to be successful. Um, who does this healthcare center serve? Uh, the people who use the center represent a broad socioeconomic spectrum of people in the county. And the reason I say it is because it's true that we have Medicaid patients who are, you know, poor individuals or who have exhausted other other uh, paying options. But really, this is a center that like a, a lot of people in the county have used over the years. And so it's not it's not just addressing the need for one smaller group. It's there's a lot of groups of people who have access points to the center. Um, what is the plan if the referendum passes? There's no specific plan yet, but the committee has been, the healthcare center committee has been discussing uh, a lot of different possibilities. And I think, you know, we're kind of waiting to see what's going to happen to really start to take a solid direction one way or the other. Uh, if it does pass, the one thing we know for certain is that the operational deficit, which has ranged, for, you know, the last couple of years after being, after the audits and whatnot, uh, around $900,000. But that will probably be lower because the census, the number of people in the facility has decreased. And so the, and we also have a lower percentage of Medicaid patients in the facility. So that means that, uh, that, that the deficit driven by that part of it is smaller as well. Uh, so it could be, say, half a million dollars. I don't know. I'm, it's just a hypothetical. But, um, but that deficit would be covered by the referendum. It essentially gives the county time to, to put the plan in place that's going to be more sustainable and try to carry the center forward. Uh, similar to if the referendum fails, there's no specific plan. Uh, there are enough reserves, I would say, to get the center through 2019. Uh, it's, it's kind of a precarious fiscal position it's in, but nevertheless, I think you'd see 2019 being kind of that window of now we really have to figure out what we're doing without the referendum support. Uh, it would certainly be in the best interest of everybody involved uh, to come to a resolution sooner rather than later. Uh, no decisions have been made at all. The, all options, as far as I can see, are on the table. So the, the committee and the county be looking at each of those and figuring out what's, where do we go from here. Uh, just examples I listed there were, would be selling the center, a partnership, or some sort of regionalization has been floated around. Uh, but really, the worst option by far would be closing the center. So uh, if you didn't get a copy of this, it will be on the county website. It'll be on the league's Facebook page at a minimum. If you don't use the, any of those resources, that, talk to me afterward, and I'll make sure you get a copy. We have some questions. Um, this money will just be for the next four years. What will happen after that? And what would it mean for Portage County residents to not have a five-star Medicare-rated facility in our area? Okay, yes, it would only be for the next four years. And what was the second one? Sorry. What will happen after that? Oh, after that, it's uh, the county could go back to referendum again. Uh, ideally, I think, you know, the county, as far as I know, has never been through a budget prioritization process. Uh, you know, the, the health care center is a discretionary program, but there's a large sum of money that's discretionary within the county. And what I want to do is take the county next year, take the county board through a process that will allow them to prioritize where that goes. So hopefully, if, if at the end of four years, we'll have a very firm idea of where the county's priorities are, where the board wants to go. And so feasibly, there could be more levy support to cover whatever the health care center may look like at that point. Uh, if, the, if it couldn't do that, then you'd have to go back to referendum. And what would it mean if, the, if, if there wasn't the five-star Medicare facility in our area? Uh, I suppose if there was no health care center facility in our area, there are numerous facilities in Wausau. It's 29 miles away. It would be, uh, you know, 
a burden in a sense to have to drive up there uh, but compared to many other counties in the state we're extremely fortunate that that is there let alone that we have our resources here there are some counties who have no home and they're hours away from a hospital or or from a, a, a nursing a nursing home or healthcare center our next question is what will be the cost per taxpayer to support this referendum the healthcare center Sure, it's, I actually put, I plugged it here in this gap. It's $24.48 per $100,000 of property value. So you can similarly kind of extrapolate from there. Okay, the next question is, if the referendum is approved by voters, will the 1.4 million be used only for the health care center or will the county divert money to other departments or programs? <laughs> no, that's a good question. Um, Ultimately, the purpose of the referendum is for the operations of the center. So I think if the county were to try to do that, you're really gambling with the trust of the voters. In my opinion, uh, no, you wouldn't divert the money anywhere else. Uh, there is, I mean, feasibly in some alternate dimension, if the healthcare center wasn't around and the money was still in the bank there, you'd have to, you'd have to answer the question then. Short of that, uh, the money that you would take would go to, you know, to support the operations. If there was any excess beyond that, then there would be a dedicated account for the center where it would sit. Uh, there is a question, of course, of, you know, if the deficit was, say, $700,000 and not $1.4 million, and maybe you needed $100,000 in excess support for operating the center, uh, I think there's a strong argument that you would only exceed the levy for $800,000 and not just take one point four for the sake of taking one point four because ultimately it's the taxpayer's money. You, you don't, if there's an articulate plan that you can say, here's where we're gonna spend the money, then I think you can say, you can provide that picture to taxpayers. But I, I would be reluctant to just take it for the sake of taking it and, and ferret it away without knowing what's going to happen with it. And that would help to alleviate any worries about, you know, wh what do we do in the event that, you know. Um, the future of the health care center was evaluated by the county in 2001 and in 2013. Why wasn't any action taken then? Uh, great questions. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think we're in an era where a lot of things similar to the health care center have come to the point where decisions have to be made. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of inertia behind the lack of action, which makes all those decisions uh, more difficult than they would have been had they been made in the past. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, Sharon says we have time for two more questions. The Healthcare Center Committee commissioned St. Norbert's Survey Center to conduct a survey about the healthcare center. Did the results show support for the healthcare center and additional spending for it? Yeah, the survey did show uh, pretty overwhelming support, really, for for the center and for uh, for funding it. It was, you know, if you combine the top two categories, it was uh, about 93% showing support, which is which is a big deal. I think the the only thing you might say is that the the survey was really looking at the public's perception of the center. It wasn't necessarily looking at kind of finite numbers and everything else. It's it's not to say that that support doesn't exist. It's just to say that uh, you know there are Jefferson County, for instance, they they did an advisory referendum and the county voters came back and said we overwhelmingly support. Uh, the idea of funding this center and then when the county went to actual referendum the voters annihilated it and they lost and so I think it's it's an important survey in terms of the questions that were asked and it has lots of good information in it but I, it doesn't necessarily translate into say a success for the referendum and and St. Norbert said that as well when they when they presented all their results but nevertheless I think uh, everybody involved was uh, surprised to see that 93 percent came back uh, in terms of the public's perception of the center and the idea of funding it. Okay. Um, the health care center has been providing skilled nursing for over 100 years. Why did the county cut the funding from over $650,000 in 2016 to, to just 100000 in 2017? That's a good question. I think uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier. I think there's probably a lot of reasons for it. Some of it was that the past levy money that wasn't spent by the center. There were arguments about this. I mean, I've been through the minutes, but uh, uh, about, you know, 
whether or not the, the facility should give that money back to the county. They didn't give it back to the county and kept it in their reserves. And so some of that is why. Some of that, I think, is also because there was, a, you know, when you're faced with, uh, if you want to provide this service and that service and you need to find money and it's a choice between two mandatories and a discretionary, then you're going to go to the discretionary funding and then take, some, take from there and then fund over here. Um, so I think there's just kind of, Every year you're moving money around, reducing levels of service, cutting programs, trying to make that amount of money that you can tax work as well as possible for all the programs and services that are in place. And one more. Mm -hmm. When was the health care center built and was it the public who requested it to be built here in the first place? Uh, I don't know who originally requested it, but it's, you know, and I think you'd have to look at when it was, you know, it's been in business for 100 years. Its current location, I think, was since 31. But, uh, but yeah, it's been around for a long time. And I'd have to go way back in the meeting minutes to find out who really requested it. <laughs> I'll look for it. Okay, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight and participating. Um, remember, we do have the slips um, up here on the table saying when um, this will be shown on Charter Channel 984. Um, I'll just briefly say Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Monday um, it'll be shown. Um, Please join me in thanking all of our presenters from tonight. And you are welcome to join the presenters in the lobby if you would like to continue the discussion. Thank you again for coming tonight, and the election is Tuesday, November 6th.